Well, this is exciting. <laughs> um, this is our first in studio guest, none other than Mr. John Philpot, who also happens to be on our board of directors here at Travada. So we're really excited about this episode, and we're really thankful that you were willing to join us today, John. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, this is Fintech Corner, and I'm Joseph Drambarian, uh, your host and the Chief Product Officer here at Travada. I'm joined by Brett Turner, our founder and CEO and fearless leader. <laughs> um, and today, we're going to dig into a story that I know I have wanted to hear for a very long time. I think the context here is, if you kind of rewind the tape all the way back, I think at this point, when, was, uh, when were we kind of talking for the first time, John? Is it like four years ago? At this point, this we just crossed four years yeah, when the investment came in. Years. Yeah, I remember the first time Brett told me uh, the story of uh, some of your background because you've had a story pass, amazing, uh, a legendary. Uh, and one of the, the pieces of that kind of story is S1. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about S1. And so Brett was kind of telling me a little bit about the early days of Internet banking <laughs> when the Internet wasn't a thing. And so that's just fascinating. Uh, and I was hoping that if you're open to sharing uh, a little bit about that story, the reason why we love to hear this story is because we feel very much like right now at Travada, we're living through almost a second or third generation of that very same story just playing out in a different way. So I don't know. I thought it might be cool to just kind of reminisce. Absolutely. And just see what it looked like in that iteration of the story. I, I think one, maybe a little setup too thing also is just anytime you're, you're looking for investors and raising capital. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's also, there's a, it's a, it's a little bit like a marriage. You're trying to make sure you get the right fit both on both sides. And you, you, you want to just find uh, an investor, you know, you can really work well together and just haven't been doing this sport of startups for a long time. For me, just somebody who really understands like how to operate a business, you know, how his right. o real operator experience. And one of the things right, right out of the gate, it was apparent that John had that. And just his experience, his background, it's like he can really be helpful in terms of our journey. And then the, the, the more we kind of peeled back and the more I was learning his story, the more it's like, are you kidding me? This is uncanny. I mean, the, the, just the, how, how it was sort of Travada 2.0 now versus what he kind of already did Travada 1.0 in some ways, a little different, but it was amazing how, how really the, the parallels between the stories and your early story with internet banking is amazing. So paint the picture for us, John. Yeah, uh, <laughs> what is the, like, if we're going to intro scene into, yeah. into what's happening during this time, um, let me see if I have some of the details right. The internet is pretty much brand new <laughs> in many ways, right? We have HTML pages. We're starting to get a little bit more creative in terms of what they can do. Um, but the concepts that we have today, you know, security, APIs, all of those things, cloud, <laughs> that, take all of that, put it aside. That doesn't exist yet. Right. Uh, so what, what did it look like back then? What were some of the conversations that you were having, uh, and what did it feel like kind of being in that environment? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thanks so much for having me. And this is, I'm super excited about this and, and absolutely looking forward to the conversation. But, um, you know, I think it was the Wild West. Uh, I mean, think just as you mentioned, um, we started S1 in 1995. Um, we basically had, a, there was a multi-bank holding company uh, based in Kentucky, and we converted one of their uh, thrifts, which was a small bank in um, Pineville, Kentucky. It was actually before Google Maps, you, you needed an atlas to find it. Um, and we <laughs> basically <awesome. laughs> um, turned that into um, the first bank on the internet. So we started it in kind of 95 and, um, and launched and did the, the very first uh, bill payment on online and um, kind of grew it from there. And we started on the retail side. And essentially, we originally started the bank because we thought without the branch infrastructure, we could uh, use it to 
as a way to get very low cost deposits. We didn't have to oh, have a building and things like that. And so we thought we could charge a competitive rate right. and, um, and kind of grow it from there as a, as a cheap way to build deposits to, to use for the rest of the bank holding company to, to do small business lending and things like that. So at that point, it, there wasn't even, I, I, I'm just assuming, there wasn't a vision yet of like, holy cow, this could be every bank's experience. Right. <laughs> so we launched it, which was great. So we launched it. And um, I think we pretty soon after we had a, a big event in New York and, and we paid the first bill payment to um, the American Red Cross. It was a donation to the American nice. Red Cross. And then um, very classy. <laughs> right. and, then, um, and then we started realizing that the vast majority of our customers were other bankers. And so we started getting calls from, from other banks and, um, pretty soon thereafter, probably within kind of the next 24 months, we decided to sell the bank uh, because it was a lot more profitable and certainly a lot more fun to be uh, a software company. So, Whoa. So, so then it's this the digital experience. I mean, that's really what took really took off from there. And Yeah. And, you know, we tried to do some things to, to make it approachable as we were teaching people about online banking. So if you look at the Wayback Machine, um, our first little web page was uh, the inside of a bank branch and we even so we had a little um a little teller scene on our web page and, and awesome. some of our customer <laughs> service reps and we had a little security guard in the corner uh that you could click on to talk about you know security and what was ssl and some of these i, I love this. that sounds like the 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 metasphere <laughs> <laughs> no you know what is cool about this it reminds me of okay do you remember back when the iphone first came out they had this concept of skeuomorphic design it was basically when you look at the app, it looks like it's a real piece of leather or it looks like it's a real uh, calendar that you would see in, you know, like a daily planner or those types of concepts. This is reminding me of how far we've evolved just from a design experience because when you rewind the tape, people weren't used to interacting with computers. Right. So you have yeah. to create these metaphors that get them comfortable, right? The idea that someone was willing to do bill pay on a computer at back that time, then, yeah, is kind of <laughs> like <laughs> let it me pick really up my brains off the floor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can't even believe that. Well, it was kind of interesting because you know there were kind of two really big hurdles. The first was that um, you weren't able; the, it was really difficult to get deposits. So right. in order to deposit checks, people actually had to mail the check to Pineville, Kentucky. So that was a big that was a big hurdle to cross to yeah. get folks to basically wow. believe that they were sending their check somewhere. <laughs> the other interesting thing that we saw was the adoption life cycle, to your point. Yeah. Um, customers getting excited about it. And I can tell you ninety eight percent of our customers went through the same journey with online bill payment in that the very first bill payment they would make was to themselves for a dollar. <laughs> to test which, it. To test well, it. Yeah. Is this <laughs> legit? Right. Yeah. Is this legit? And, you know, Will this time, work? Our cost per transaction was almost $2. So oh my losing goodness. Money on all these. But um, oh, they, that's crazy. So the customer would basically get the check in the mail um, and they would say, oh, this is great. I got a check for a dollar. Then the next month, what they would do is pick a non-core, you know, a bill that they didn't care about. So yeah. It was, maybe it was the yard service or something they would... Utility bill or something, yeah. Well, not quite yet. No? Okay. <laughs> the lights may go off. Hold on. Right. And right. so, um, you know, they, they would do that. The, the yard service would show up the next month and they'd say, this is great. Then they would pick a kind of a non-core utility. So okay. not like mortgage or water or power. But, you know, maybe it was their cable TV bill or something like that. And then really, by that six month, um, they were starting to do things like putting on their mortgage and those things. Wow. But 98% of our customers kind of went through that same journey. Six month process of just trust. Right. Wow. Yeah. So let me ask you this. One thing that obviously, and this is, you know, from the perspective of technology, I can give this opinion definitively. Nothing keeps me up more at night than dealing with payments. Just the reliability of it, the uptime, the redundancy. Um, it's a lot of my kind of thought process throughout a day. How did it feel back then knowing that you don't have scalable cloud right. infrastructure, you have servers, boxes. Yeah. You probably could go to your server 
and kick it. Right. Oh, yeah, they were, the, yeah, they were down, it, it was down the hall. So Don't kick it. <laughs> Don't touch it. That's, that's called a bank failure, right? <laughs> right? Absolutely. Well, I mean, it was, it, it was, it really was a free for all. So, um, there were times, um, I was, um, dating my, my wife now at the time. And if the bill payment file didn't go through, I, I would have to personally handwrite all the checks. Oh my so goodness. So she would come what? to visit. She <laughs> lived in a different town. And before we could go out to dinner, we would each take a pile of checks and hand write because um, we weren't able wow. to. Go the, the, and she still married you. <laughs> <She's> still married. <laughs> so it was just things like that as, as the infrastructure was starting to age and uh, that sort of thing. The ultimate Amazing. redundancy. The ultimate redundancy. <laughs> that is awesome. So then people, I'm assuming, are loving how convenient it is, right? Because. You said six months, but over those six months, you're just probably light bulbs are going off of like, oh man, this is so much better. I don't have to write checks. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. So what is happening with the the banks that you're talking to at this point? Are they are the light bulbs going off as well? Yeah, very quickly, kind of the light bulbs went off. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned we we had the bank. Um, it did prove very difficult to and, and costly to try and establish a, a new brand in financial services. So. Yeah. And at the time, this was kind of in the late 90s with the internet craze, um, you know, we went public three weeks before Netscape did, and um, it became really apparent that it was going to be, um, you know, a great transition for us to, to just be a software provider selling the software to other banks. Yeah. And so we, um, we divested the, the, the actual internet bank, the banking part of our business, and became S1 to just focus um, on selling the technology. That's cool. To, to, to other well, in some ways, maybe like the bank initially was sort of like your big sandbox it totally was. To, to get it right. And then you've got this digital experience now. All the banks are, so who, like, are there, you know, banks of all sizes kind of clamoring because they want the experience or? Yeah, so, um, so we did something that was probably, um, it was risky at the time and that we started working with really big banks. <laughs> so I think the ones, and, and part of this was probably driven by um, Wells Fargo went live pretty shortly thereafter. And so um, with you or their own with something that they had built. Okay. Around. Okay. And so there was then a kind of a big wave of folks that wanted to, um, to start internet banking. And, and we also realized too, that, uh, we kind of started on the retail side, but we were starting to get engagement from small business. We were starting to right. get engagement on the corporate side. And so at that point, we started to expand our product offering to start to release small business features, to start to release corporate banking features. And at the end, we ended up having a full suite that could take you all the way from a retail customer all the way up to, to very, very large corporate customers. How does it feel to be in that pressure cooker at the time because it it kind of sounds like it was everything all at once it pretty much opportunity rich corporates reaching out big banks reaching out retail banks reaching out you know small business and uh you know <laughs> which one do we do four four legs of the stool right. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we. Our, our, our our last night dinner conversation around our focus, focus. areas right focus. Yeah, so we um you know, I, I, again, did not follow that advice. We, um, <laughs> we were spinning a lot of plates. But um, I think one of the things that was just fascinating is that um, the banks were learning how to adopt the technology while the, um, while the consumers were as well. Right. So I think it was a learning experience for everybody. That was also, if you think about it, the late 90s, it was a really dynamic time in terms of a lot of innovation, a lot of um, it, across all inter, in, in industries, you had things like you know the Pets.com sock puppet and some of those things where sorry, it was almost I don't know what that is. <laughs> I lived through that, so this is like no, this is my language. <laughs> I started my career in '95, right. so just that that part of it, it just was a fascinating compared to where things are at now. Oh, it's amazing. But I, yeah, it just the doing what you're doing with what we had then was crazy ambitious. Uh, it, it, but so if you look at the experience then you're now starting to sell to other banks and you know maybe fast forward a little bit where we are today it's like the 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 how much really has it changed in a lot of ways like the legacy of what you had built and where that carried on 
you see so many aspects of that still today, even at whether small banks, but even some of the bigger banks too. Oh, for sure. And actually, one of the reasons we were excited about the investment in Travada is that I kind of saw it as the next generation of what we had built with S1. You know, one of the things that was amazing was um, we there there were still banks that had our old S1 technology is their front end amazing, on the internet yeah. side. So, so satisfying. <laughs> that, that, that That's amazing. Point, we were excited to kind of say, okay, what's this next generation of cash? And I think um, one of the things that, that we got super excited about was just, you know, with your, your background and, and kind of living in the trenches and understanding the cash flow forecasting and the analytics and the, the, the needs and how they've evolved, uh, got us super excited about working with the Travada crew. So what was, uh, as you're going through the tail end of the ride, the middle sounds wild. It just sounds as if like all the blur <laughs> in the internet is happening. You know, it's, it's coming to life. It sounds like it started to really take a hold in terms of sales, revenue, and exploding. What happened next? Did you guys end up staying just here in the U.S. or did this go like gangbusters? No, we, we actually, it ended up being international. So, wow. um, you know, I think the company kind of grew and scaled and we ended up uh, selling the technology. One of the other things that, that S1 did is we made um, a lot of acquisitions. So we, we started adding uh, additional channels. Uh, one of the things we recognized when we started rolling out all these internet banking platforms uh, was that customers would call the call center and have a question about what was going on at the internet. I was I was wondering or about this. Or they'd walk into the branch <laughs> and say, yeah. "Hey, my water bill didn't get paid this month," and the teller would kind of look at them. And say, Gosh, I, you know, I don't know what's going on there? So we we kind of the company evolved to be. Yeah, it was um, kind of a multi-channel play where the goal was to kind of basically say, could we build a platform that could manage all of the front end interactions with the bank? So yeah. we did call center, we did teller, we did mm. um, VRU for voice response units. So if you called and wanted to talk to an automated attendant, those sorts of things. So wow. So was this same playbook working in every market internationally? Or did you guys have to tweak kind of the distribution of each market because of local regulations and all of that. Yeah, so we had we definitely had to customize. There they were different payment types, obviously, you know, multi-language and currency right. and those sorts of things, different rules and regulations. Um, all of that, you know, played into it. It actually was a little bit easier to go international because in the US we had thousands and thousands of banks. So we had to service everything from community and regional banks all the way up to Bank of America. Um, in the international markets, it's a little bit easier because, um, you know, there are four big banks in Thailand. Right. There are three big banks in Jordan. And that's so there weren't as many banks, but the banks were bigger. Right. Sure. Mm. What was uh, what was your favorite city traveling internationally? I think Singapore was probably my favorite. Nice. Yeah. And this was in the go-go era of Singapore. Because right now, if you compare Singapore today to then, I mean, it's probably a night and day difference, I'm assuming. So everything was getting built in the same way back then as, you know, what was happening domestically with kind of the internet kind of growing. And I just, I love this story because I know that you are very, uh, you understate it, but when I kind of soak in it, I just think to myself, what an epic ride, right? Like taking something that started as a bank, no intention of it being, you know, a global platform. And then just one opportunity after another, just knocking at your door, having to react, having to solve problems, having to grow, acquire companies. I mean, is there anything better? <laughs> it just sounds amazing. <laughs> it was. And we, you know, I think, and, and we had a fantastic team. Right? Yeah. So I think that's, I think one of the things that, that's fun about the start, and that's, I think, now being on the investor side, the, the team makes such a difference. And yeah. Just the, the, the folks that you kind of go into battle with and uh, the expertise that you pick up along the way and those sorts of things make make all the difference in the world in terms of trying to build a good, really robust comp um, you know company. And I think one of the things is, is that's fun as we watch companies like Travada grow is as you kind of scale, you have different issues. So, so when you hit different revenue milestones or you have a certain number of customers on the system, 
um, you know, as, as the water flows through the pipes, you start to see where the leaks are. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to fix this one. And uh, inadvertently, that breaks something downstream, and so you have to kind of run over to the next one. Yeah. So that's, I love the dynam- you know, the dynamic nature of, of startups. And Absolutely. If, if you look at, so all those, I mean, Herculean challenges at that time, you're dealing with, you know, in some ways, versus what we have today, almost like caveman tools to kind of, achieved it, which is remarkable. You kind of fast forward like where we are and now we're creating this new digital experience and sort of traversing the gap really between the bank um, and ERP system and all this growing chasm and void of all these things. But, uh, you know, it's building a company regardless is never easy. Uh, We just face different kind of obstacles. It's not, you know, Thankfully, and my wife would probably shoot me if this is the case where she's having to write a check. <laughs> it might have not have fared so well. Right. But uh, but if you look at now where the, the everything is so well established and and now even where banking is at and how, how to then change some of their behaviors and migrate into these next gen experiences even beyond that. Right. Like what do you maybe see some of the the bigger challenges maybe are they easier? Are they harder? Are they just different? You know, I think it's kind of different. You know, there it's interesting because you have things like regulatory. So in the early days, we had to spend an enormous amount of time with the regulators to basically say, here's what, in, this is what we're going to be doing. This is how it's going to work. So we had to do a lot of training from a regulatory standpoint. Um, but I think as these new products and services and kind of waves of innovation take, um, it does take time to scale and change customer behavior, you know, one of the things that um, that is actually, if you think about the decade of kind of 2000 to 2010, the number one um, kind of financial services technology um, innovation that had the most impact on the banking business was remote deposit capture. Uh, oh, yeah. Because if you think about just the sheer infrastructure that banks used to have to have, to manage checks, you had to basically take the check, you had to image the check, you had to store the check, you yep. had to get the check to the Fed, you then had to, you know, and and just that, the sheer amount of kind of cost and efficiency that remote deposit capture added to the system had a meaningful impact yeah. to kind of the P&L of these banks. And so I think it's very similar when you think about some of the technology initiatives that we're looking at today. So if you think about kind of chat GPT and some of the things that are going to come when you think about some of this innovation, certainly blockchain has, you know, forget all the, the, the coin stuff, but blockchain in and of itself and smart contracts, you know, these are, are really, really compelling innovations that are going to have a major impact on how banks do business. Um, and, it inevitably new issues will crop up uh, in terms of uh, you know how how we handle and, and deploy these technologies and, and we're gonna realize that we're gonna break things um, in right. other areas of the bank when we stand it up here. But uh, again, I think that's what what makes you know fintech and financial services technology such a fun place to to invest and do business in because these these innovations have a dramatic impact on the way that these organizations are doing business. If you think about some of the initiatives you all have at Travada in terms of being able to do cash flow forecasting and planning, the ability to help a, a small business manage their cash, which is the lifeblood of what they're doing every day, um, and providing real actionable insights has a dramatic impact on these businesses and, and their ability to, to grow and scale, which I think is super exciting. Mm. I know we are getting close on time, but I wanted to ask this question because it's one that we talk about this all the time. In the moment, we never really get a chance to process what's happening. It just feels like a giant blur, right? Like we went through COVID. We went through the economic you know, situation that we're going through right now. Silicon Valley Bank deciding uh, you know, to, to go. Um, all of these things just happen. And hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You look back at it and you go like, well, you know, we could have done things this way, that way. And then this is putting you on the spot a little bit, so I'm yeah. sorry. Is there anything you would have changed about the experience? Is there anything that you would take back uh, that now kind of looking back all that time, seeing everything, how it played out? Yeah, I, I think I think the answer is no. I think in any experiences, you're, you know, part of the, I think part of the fun is the journey. It's skinning your knee. It's the, 
you know, going down a certain path. It's the pivot. It's the, you know, I, I don't think I would change a thing. I love that. I think that's cool. Just, it's just so exciting and dynamic to be. And, and again, I think I loved the scaling part. I loved the growth part. I think that's one of the reasons why I was excited to, to move to the venture side because, you know, it's, it's a small part of me being able to kind of live vicariously through other teams to, to kind yeah. of relive those kind of glory days of, you know, having things not work or, you know, having a programmer come in and say that they had stayed up all night trying to get the debit card to access the CD and having to tell them you, uh, you can't have a debit card access the CD. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, dear God. <laughs> and so just things like that where you just kind of say basically, yeah, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I think everybody kind of wears their scars proudly. If you looked like, so that, that whole you know, rise was really dependent on the banks to embrace what you were doing. And they did. And, and now you kind of look at where they're at now and they need to embrace a lot of things. I mean, FinTech is, is going crazy just because in some ways the banks maybe aren't embracing things or maybe aren't doing it as fast. Where, where do you kind of see things play out? Like, especially our journey, we work with banks, you know, everybody knows the banks are a little slower. They've got a lot more to contend with maybe even than they did, you know, back then. Like how, how do you see them sort of traversing especially in the light of the last couple of months that's, you know, brought, you know, at least some, you know, or some new uncertainties a little bit. How, how, where do you see the banks kind of traversing from here? And, and where do they, you know, embrace a Travada or other things to really, you know, like they did back to, you know, in your days? Yeah, so I, I think it's really important. So, so obviously they need a commitment to innovation. And it is difficult because they, they do – operate in a regulatory driven environment and so they they do have kind of a lot of demands on on their business and how they scale but i think um you know the best banks that we see are very proactive they have a a learning mindset they they love r d they're doing pilots they're going out into the ecosystem and engaging with companies and those sorts of things and and i think part of the deal now in banking is you have to have a commitment to innovation you have to um, at least have a toe in, uh, you know, in terms of how some of these new technologies are growing and scaling. And, and you need to keep an eye on the horizon as to how these things are going to impact your business because, um, you know, these innovations are, are amazing and they can have a, a meaningful impact in terms mm-hmm. of how they do their business and how they serve their customers. Cool. Well, John. Yeah, you're a really busy man (laughs) and really appreciate you taking uh, some time out of your day to record a pod with us. This has been amazing. I've loved the stories. So, um, yeah, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you sharing. Uh, This was great. And uh, this has been FinTech Corner and we'll see you next time.